Um, you know what you reminded me of with the talk of taking an oath to the Constitution? It reminded me of my favorite segment of last show, where you were asked about what monarchs have you met, and you gave a wonderful story of King Kigali. And yeah. part of the point of answering that question was to illustrate how monarchy engages the emotions. Yeah. It is personal. And I think this discussion with swearing an oath to the Constitution compared to swearing to the queen or the king is just light years different. I mean, the feeling... Yeah. Really no one really cares about I mean, it, it, the Constitution, as we said, is everyone's plaything. There's no actual respect for the Constitution. Um, you know, with Roe v. Wade, I mean, that shows us right there. You know, we'll do whatever Consti- we want with it. Yeah, and yet that's we... Yeah, the Constitution, in the American mythos, the Constitution actually takes the place of the king. But it's a deaf, dumb, and blind king who's completely the slave of its ministers. Now, the queen really pretty much has to do what her ministers tell her. Justice in Britain is administered in the queen's name, but she has no control over it. Hmm. What her views are of anything political are anyone's guess. She doesn't vote. Neither she nor the members of the royal family vote. And they have to do everything they can to avoid appearing partisan. So this has been very difficult sometimes. When um, in 1932, was it, 33, the first labor government in Britain, King George V had to make a socialist prime minister of Great Britain. And he wasn't happy about it. But he did it. Very often, these people have to sacrifice their own views of things. Uh, Isn't there well, sort of a moral obligation sometimes, though? I mean, what what is lost and what is gained here? Well, see, there you come into the realm of prudential judgment. Yeah. A Britain, a Britain, let's put it this way. If you look at the history of Europe, you'll see one monarchy after another fell because the monarch refused to give in at this point or that point. We consider them, and I think rightfully, heroic. But were the results very good? What the British monarchy as it it currently exists has been is something entirely different. I, you know, myself, I admire James II far more than I could any of his successors who actually occupied the throne. But the argument could be made that James II, in the end, and I say it could be made, I don't say I hold it because I don't, but it could be made that James II would have done his country a, a lot of good had he been more like his brother. But, uh, you know, we consider his brother something of a... Of a uh, uh, scandal and himself a uh, a martyr to conscience but would britain have been better off under king james staying on the throne despite not getting everything he wanted or having what happened uh, dutch william coming over see these are things people are going to argue about forever i see so you're saying it's like a tactical deference where you defer to um this you know to perhaps a socialist being prime minister because if you didn't there well, might it might go poorly for you well it's not just not just for me yeah for not just for, for the whole country i mean yeah. i mean it's it's sort of like mutatis mutandis remember he did win the election yeah and there is this myth that people are very much in love with called democracy Yeah. Now, I'll give you another example of a king doing something which we could discuss whether or not he did the right thing. 
1946 in Italy. King Umberto II was deposed because of a, of a plebiscite that everybody knew was rigged. So the chiefs of the military said to him, you know, your majesty, everybody knows this thing's a charade. If you, you know, call a halt to it and we will, we will subdue things and, uh, you know, you can go on as you have. But the king thought quite possibly correctly that uh, if he did that, there would be a civil war. Now, Italy had just come through World War II. And so, King Umberto did not think that the throne was worth Italy going into a civil war, especially not on the heels of what they'd just been through the three preceding years. So he abided by the plebiscite and he flew off to Portugal. Now, the argument could be made that Italy would have been a, a lot better off had he stayed and had they fought that civil war and rooted out the enemy, root and branch. Well, maybe. But that was his decision, and it's important to bear in mind that he didn't look at the Italians the way a president would look at them, but the way a king would look at them. Did he want his people suffering and dying again for his crown? As I say, in the, in the long run, it might have been better had he fought that civil war. But I'm not in the position of having to make that decision. I am. I have very little historical knowledge of anything, but the more very few people do. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm very. I'm quite pathetic on history, but the little that I, the, or excuse me, the more that I, I read up on history and see history, it seems like uh, in older times rulers would get tough decisions wrong more often than not. Like, like I mean, uh, they, they're faced with tough decisions, and sometimes they make a mistake, but it was a tough decision. But it seems like nowadays there are easy decisions, and they get they're, – they're, they're just stupid. It's just, what were you thinking? And whereas well, perhaps back in the day, it, that wasn't the case. It's like, Well, let's just say that when you're dealing – when all the statesmen you're dealing with are smarter, and when you yourself are smarter, and when your subjects tend to be smarter, well, what happens is that things as a rule aren't quite as stupid as when everyone's dumb. <laughs> okay, so you're saying, see, I was actually looking for confirmation for you because that was my impression off yeah. my, my little reading that, that this is the case that you know, these are tough well, decisions like a hundred years ago and such. And now there are easy decisions that we're fumbling around with. In well, I, I, I don't know. That's entirely true. I mean, you, you, you're right. I think it's in some ways, part of the problem is that a lot of the easier decisions, if you've got a moral code, they're not a problem. Mm. I mean, they're not even a question. Yeah. But if everything is on the basis of expedience and self advantage, then that makes even simple stuff hard. Oh. It's easier to tell right from wrong than it is to tell what's going to benefit me. That explains it. And if you take away right from wrong, and, and mind you, human beings, human beings, being human beings, right and wrong and advantage, those two are always present in everyone. But if you take right and wrong away completely, and all you're left with is expedience. Well, then it gets real hard. <laughs> I guess that's it. I guess that explains everything. Well, you get you get rid of you know you get rid of a moral code, then all you've got is self-interest. But self-interest is hard to read <laughs> because it's shifting constantly. Oh wow! There it is. What's going to do me the most good this second? As opposed to tomorrow. <laughs> wow. Okay. And, I mean, 
poor poor King Roberto had a had a terrible choice. Another example uh, of of a man who was really screwed over badly was King Leopold III of the Belgians. Now you remember him in 1940, Belgium, France, Luxembourg. All right. Well, the Queen of the Netherlands, the Grand Duchess of Luxembourg, fled. Yeah. They ended up going to Britain, forming uh, governments in exile. Yeah. The way uh, the King of Norway did, the King of Greece, King of Yugoslavia. So they're in exile. Yeah. But the King of the Belgians stayed behind. Now, he was commander in chief. Remember, he's a constitutional monarch, like the British king. But he's also actually commander in chief of his army. Now, his father in World War I had stayed with the army, although the Belgian army had been pushed to the very further edge of the country. And he was there on the front. He shared everything with his men, like uh, Emperor Carl or King Victor Emmanuel. And so they called him the Night King because he was such a brave soldier. So he dies in 1934. Leopold, his son, becomes the king. And he's as devoted to the military as his father is. And this you, you often see in monarchies because uh, the, your troops have sworn an oath to you to die for you. So you'd have to be kind of a nasty, brutish kind of person not to take a deep interest in their welfare. All right. So Leopold III is commanding the troops. The Germans come pouring in. And then they smash through the French, through the Ardennes, and cut the Belgian, French, and British armies off from France. And the evacuation of the British and the French was Dunkirk, which yeah, you've heard of. Of course. But the Belgians had no place to go. So King Leopold III surrendered. And he stayed with his, with his army. And then after uh, it was over, he and his, uh, and his wife were kept in house arrest uh, for the rest of the war. Now, this allowed a lot of communists and socialists to spread the idea that he had been pro-German, which he was anything but. But after the war, he, wanted, he had been taken away to Germany as a, by the Germans as they took away a lot of other people at the last minute. <clears throat> so he wanted, of course, to return and take up where he left off as king. But the communists and the socialists were opposed. And Belgium was literally split in two over the issue of the king. So he decided in the end that his effectiveness was destroyed because he couldn't act as king of all the Belgians. So he abdicated in favor of his son, King Baudouin. Hmm. But what a terrible thing. You know, unlike so many of his critics, he was actually at the front during the fighting. And he shared his men's privations in the camp afterwards. And then he was under house arrest. But lesser men, who had gone through very little in the war, they were the ones who decided that there was no way he should be allowed to return. That's justice for you, isn't it? Mm. That's real justice. And that, you know, mutatis mutandis, it's like here in this country, in Austria. Uh, the Archduke Otto, the head of the House of Habsburg, heir to the throne, spent the war in Washington convincing President Roosevelt that Austria was as much a victim as Poland or any other country, Czechoslovakia or whatever, and that as a result, she should have her independence restored after the war. And they, he, that is the reason why there is an Austria today. Uh, Contrary-wise, when his two younger brothers, three younger brothers, graduated from university in '44. He sent them into Austria to fight with the resistance. And that's where they were when the Axis were defeated, risking their lives fighting the, uh, the Nazis. Meanwhile, Karl Renner, the worthless leader of the socialists, 
who had uh, had the socialists vote for the Anschluss in 38, who tried to collaborate with the Nazis, but they, they wouldn't accept him. But they had thought so little of him, they didn't even arrest him. So he spent the war living in comfort in Vienna. Well, when the Soviets invade and take Vienna, he writes Stalin an obsequious letter offering his services, not realizing that Stalin was looking for him because he knew he could use him. So Stalin makes him chancellor of Austria. First thing he does is have the Habsburgs expelled. And then an election is held, the socialists lose, so Stalin insists to the other Western powers who are also occupying the rest of Austria that Renner be made president. And so Karl Renner was president of Austria until he died in 1950. And all over this country, you'll see streets and squares named after him. Yeah. Most people don't know their history because if they did, they wouldn't be ruled by the kind of people that rule them. Do Austrians share your sympathies on this, or are they just out to lunch? A chunk of them do, but you see the media and people like that will accuse anyone who points this kind of thing out as being a fascist. Oh, well, you must be a fascist if you're opposed to Renner. Well, isn't the alternative communist in this one? <laughs> It's Since Stalin it's just, appointed him? It's just crazy. I'll put this another way. Uh, look at Mayor de Blasio of New York. Let's not. No, we will. We want, we're going to look him in the face. Okay. He was working with the communists in Nicaragua. He calls himself a Marxist. Don't people realize... That, they, that the communists killed more people than the Nazis? How could they possibly elect a man like that? Well, why weren't de Blasio's opponents shrieking this from the house stops? Well, how come? Because it's all meaningless theory. It's just theory. It's not real life. No. Real life is being confined to your house. Oh, I'm sorry. That came out wrong. That's the whole point, and you've hit your nail on the head. People are ignorant, and they are expected to make grown-up decisions. The, uh, the vote of a World War II veteran is the same as a streetwalker. You've got me fired up, Charles. <laughs> oh, I didn't me... mean to. Uh Gosh. That's, and thank God we don't have literacy tests because they're racist. Thank God there's no ID for voters because, you know, if someone is too stupid to be able to get himself an ID, he deserves every, every right to vote as much as anyone else. And you're a racist because if you don't think so, because by definition, blacks must be incapable of doing that. That, to me, when I hear the opponents of uh, ID for voting, my only thought is they must think blacks are very stupid people. But here's my question. If they're right and blacks are too stupid to get voter ID, why do we expect driver's licenses out of them? Why do we expect uh, ID when they, when they go to the bank? Why isn't that racist? I don't know, Charles. I do. The founders claimed that the United States would only work if it had an educated electorate. Our current rulership prefers as big an electorate as possible, regardless of its ability to read or even think. One can only presume that they derive some advantage from it. Usually people don't support things that they don't get an advantage out of somehow. Especially today when we've banished right and wrong from the issue. And it's just a question of what benefits me.
at the moment.